Um, well, thanks for everyone for coming to my talk today. I am going to be talking about the Hitchhiker's Guide to Open Telemetry. Now, before we jump in and go on this journey, has anyone read or seen the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yes, my nerds. I love you guys. Yeah. So, for those who don't know, we'll talk about it real quick. And it's really just about this. I, I don't even really know how to describe it. If anyone else could like really describe it, that'd be great. But essentially, what I learned from it was that this guy, Arthur Dent, is a very ordinary man. Um, when he wakes up in the morning, he's brushing his teeth, and they want to bulldoze his house. So he goes outside, weighs in front of the bulldozer, and really, it just kind of gets very meta from there. So essentially, what happens is Earth is destroyed by this or these villains, quote unquote, uh, called Vogons. Um, to build a hyperspace bypass. Now, that is like about the nerdiest thing I've read. But um, essentially, they get blasted up into space, and he survives with what's called the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And it's pretty much like the way I got it was, it was kind of like a metaphor for life. You think it's all about space, and you're going to learn everything about space, but that is not the case at all. It's actually quite a metaphor for surviving the universe and all the absurdities that come with life that we live. And you might be saying, Sean, this is the Hitchhiker's Guide to Open Telemetry. How the heck does this relate to Open Telemetry? We're going to get there, I promise. So, Arthur's world, he realizes, is very chaotic. But with space, the world we live in, very hectic. Our world and software, also very chaotic, also very hectic. Modern distributed systems are something that have grown like crazy over the last 10, 15 years. And it's just getting more complex just as vast, just as chaotic, just as absurd. I'm going to be honest, very absurd. And this is really what happened when sort of microservices arrived, right? This was like the traditional monolithic architecture, which is actually quite, quite more. Actually, some people are going back to monoliths, believe it or not. So uh, you can see here that like everything's kind of bunched under one binary or one executable, right? Or one stack. But you can see that there's the user authentication, the payment processing, order management, product catalog, all kind of lumped in one. And the issue with that, obviously, is it's not decoupled services. So you can't really scale them on their own. You kind of have to scale it all as one big thing. But the good news is that uh, API calls are cheap. Now we get into microservices, which we talked about a little bit. And you can see that this gets vastly more complicated. We have decoupling of services. We have API gateways that were introduced to be able to disperse calls. You have CDNs, you have service discovery, you have Kubernetes, you have Docker containers, you have service meshes, you have user authentication systems, you have cloud services. And this all gets a lot more complex to observe, right? So we really need a guide. How do we get through this complexity of microservices, right? And open telemetry is sort of our guide. And this don't panic, this is sort of the ethos of uh, the, guide, the guide to the galaxy, right? Like, it's pretty much saying life is absurd, life is crazy, you're about to go on a journey, but here's this manual and it says don't panic on it. That's the only advice it gives you, right? So it's like, it's a very funny play on, but essentially open telemetry is our don't panic button. Now, what is open telemetry? Now, it's an open source standard for collecting, transporting, and interpreting telemetry data. That's kind of the formal definition. We're gonna break it down and go to like very deeper levels. So. This is open telemetry's five core values. Telemetry should be built in, telemetry should be universal, should be vendor neutral, and should be loosely coupled. Now, in the, uh, the Guide to the Galaxy, what happens is there's something called Vogons. And these Vogons destroy the world with their bureaucratic pencil pushing. Now, why does that destroy the Earth? I don't know, but it does in this world. And they are kind of representing villains in the story. Now, you could say vendors that are proprietary and build proprietary agents are villains. I actually don't see it that way. I don't think that's like fair to cast on them. I think ultimately what happens is they build the technology at the time and they make certain architectural decisions, certain technical decisions, and they kind of work with what they got and try to solve the problems for their customers at hand during that time. So I don't think it's like this question of like vendors who have proprietary agents are horrible people. I think actually they solved great problems and they're continuing to do so. And even the proprietary vendors that you saw that might be quote unquote legacy, a lot of them are starting to adapt and actually support OTLP. 
and open telemetry native protocols, right? So everyone's kind of evolving. But you'll notice, does anyone notice anything weird about this slide? What's that? So five core and yourself four. Right. There's five, right? But there's only four here. And this is my favorite one. Telemetry should be damn easy. And it's not. But that is open telemetry is like big thing. It should be easy. They should have great documentation, which, oh my gosh, open source software never has good documentation, right? Also, that it should be easy to instrument and you should be able to get value out of the box very quickly. You shouldn't need to like pull your hair out of your head for hours on end trying to instrument your services and just get basic understanding of your services. And I really think open telemetry is great. And it does this through various components because open telemetry can kind of be a beast. And don't worry about all these definitions, but if you haven't heard them, I'm gonna go over them real quick. You got the instrumentation layer. And we talked about it in the last talk, right? Where we have this no code instrumentation with Bela. And actually Grafana just donated that to the um, CNCF or open telemetry. So essentially that is gonna be called uh, OBI, I believe, which uh, already is actually in its own repo in under open telemetry. So you should be able to go on GitHub and actually see that. And you have your instrumentation, which is like your SDKs, right? So is anyone like an actual, uh, sorry, that's not a, the right word, actual developer. Does anyone, is anyone like a front end or back end dev here? Okay, so like this is where you would kind of get hands on with like the manual instrumentation portion of it, right? They have like Python libraries, Go libraries, Rust, C, C++, and you can pretty much just like trick out your entire services. So like if you want to monitor a specific API call, or if you want to monitor like very specific functions, you can do that with manual instrumentation and the SDKs. Now there's also the auto instrumentation portion, which means you can pretty much just deploy, wrap it in your Docker container when you deploy it or whatever. And it kind of just goes and collects everything for you. I say collects everything for you with the should telemetry, telemetry should be easy. It's actually not always that easy sometimes. Anyone who's worked with Python, they know dependency management stinks, but, um, yeah, nonetheless, uh, the auto instrumentation is designed to sort of solve that. You know, the eBPF route or the OBI, which you're gonna see, is uh, actually sort of an evolution of that because it actually hooks into the Linux kernel. So if you're running these cloud native workloads on the Linux workloads, it's actually gonna collect it from the kernel, from syscalls, from processes, right? It's not really hooking into like the libraries per se um, or the underlying code. It's kind of doing its own thing in the kernel. Then you have the collector, and this goes into one of the core values of open telemetry, where they say, we want it to be loosely coupled, right? Or they want it to be decoupled. And what's so great about open telemetry is you have the instrumentation, which is completely separate from what's called the collector. So you have the SDKs that can export data from your apps and services. Then you have the collector, which can run a bunch of different things. You can receive data from Prometheus. You can receive it from uh, gRPC, UDP, TCP, network devices, right? All these things you can collect in the collector and you can pretty much reach out to like different cloud services, pull it in and then export it to a backend of your choosing. And then you have what's called OTLP, which is the wire protocol. And this is for actually sending the telemetry. This goes over gRPC or HTTP and it's actually through protobuf. Pop quiz, does anyone know who created gRPC or protobuf and protobuf? First company. It's a place we're in, right? They create everything. But yeah, so it, OTLP is sort of, it's the protocol that the data is essentially sent over. And depending on whether you instrument your services using gRPC or HTTP, which are microservices, we know it's important which one you choose, essentially it's going to emit through that protocol. And it has different ways of doing that. Then you have semantic conventions, which we talked a little bit about. Semantic conventions are kind of viewed as like a schema, right? We have database schemas. We do joins on tables all the time. You kind of want to be able to do the same thing with open telemetry, with your telemetry essentially, right? Metrics, logs, traces. They all have different formats, they all have different labels, they all have different conventions. What if we could create a standard convention? Crazy idea, right? But this is kind of the first stab at it. And they have semantic conventions for, I don't want to go and say every technology, but a damn lot of technologies. And you can go read the spec if you really want on Otel's website. Because like they said, telemetry should be easy. Their documentation is actually very good. And then you have resources, which are the individual actual attributes that come along with the semantic conventions, right? So if you're talking about like a Redis cache or you're talking about Mongo database, 
where you're talking about a Postgres database. They all have their own semantic uh, resources, or they have, they have their own semantic conventions, but they also have their own resources as attributes, which will be like db dot namespace, db dot um, status code, right? And then you have OTTL, and that's actually in the collector, where you can essentially transform, modify, enrich your data through pipelines, and then send it off to a backend. So I just want to throw that out there because we are going to see a little bit of that. So this is my diagram. Now I'm pretty bad at diagrams, but this is not too bad. So you can see here that we have a production cluster. And in here we have three replicas of the front end in the namespace, three replicas of the back end, which is a Python app. And then you kind of got Redis caches and Postgres databases. That actually only got two because I ran out of space and I didn't want to create a third. So those have two replicas. And the way this really works, right, is you have your JavaScript instrumentation. And front end is sort of a weird thing in um, OpenTelemetry right now because I haven't really found a way to do like auto instrumentation with it. But there is a web SDK for this. So you can see here, does my mouse work? It does. You can see that we're actually exporting out to 4318, which is an HTTP protocol endpoint for your traces. So when you actually trace things in your front-end app, you can export it out to the collector, which I'll show you in the diagram. Then there's the Automate Instrumentation port. And you can see down here, when we actually instrument Python, which you can see this is a lot easier because this is sort of manual instrumentation, right? We're actually writing JavaScript code. This is quite easy. We're just installing some dependencies. We'll probably wrap that in a virtual environment. We'll have a, the Docker container go run it. We'll define our OTL endpoint, OTLP endpoint which will actually be going out to our collector. Right now, this is just going out to 4317. It's not, nobody's really collecting it. It's just going out into the ether, right? And then you have your um, auto instrumentation command to run. So you do that, and then you kind of get this. So data starts shooting out, ideally, hopefully. But the good news is when you, when you auto instrument something like Python, when it makes calls to your Postgres database or your Redis cache, it's actually gonna trace that, right? So it actually does hook into those calls. So you can see things like, what is the SQL statement I made or the SQL call I made or query, right? And then these are all the semantic conventions that you would probably see with this, right? So you see things like service names, right? This is where correlation gets like very interesting and like Causally does as well, Grafana does it, Datadog does it, Splunk does it, Dynatrace does it, the list goes on. Grind cover does it, sorry. And uh, so you can see here that we have service.name. And these are sort of the resources that I was talking about, right? We want semantic conventions. We want a common schema for how this data is transmitted through. Now I am curious, and I wanna know if anyone can catch this. Also, can you guys see this file? I'm sorry if it's a little small. Does anyone notice a problem with these semantic conventions? It's probably not obvious, but if you know Prometheus, you might understand. Okay, so if you look here, you'll see that there's an HTTP.URL. Does anyone, I'll ask a different question. Does anyone know what one of the biggest problems with Prometheus is? Cardinality. Cardinality, my friend, yes. So you see here that if you get something like an HTTP URL and you have, let's say, an ID being passed through your URL and you're actually creating span metrics from your traces, what do you think is gonna happen to cardinality? It's gonna jack up, right? So usually you can actually emit those in the open telemetry collector. So if you want to say like, hey, don't collect that, you can do that. Um, and then you can actually just use the, something like the route, which will give you this colon ID. And then it would be better to probably pass that attribute, maybe uh, HTTP URL and something like a log, because logs can deal with cardinality better, right? Or even in your trace. But it's not great when you're dealing with metrics. So that's just like a kind of like a pro tip you want to be wary of because we run into it all the time at Grafana. But yes, this is essentially, you can see here, the semantic conventions at play. So Postgres and things like Redis will have very similar um, semantic conventions or resources that are attached to them. And then you'll see things like the language SDKs that have similar ones as well, like the HTTP calls, the status codes that go along with it. Now, this is sort of where things got interesting because I shared a collector configuration. 
And you can see here that, like I mentioned, this will go over 4318 uh, because like I showed you in this decode snippet, but actually be exporting out. And then you'll see here that this is sort of the open telemetry collector configuration that we're pushing into the collector. So you can kind of view that. I didn't draw an arrow, but it's going into the collector. And the receiver is up here. It's saying, listen over OTLP for uh, the gRPC and HTTP endpoints over 4318 and 4317. So when we deploy that auto instrumentation or that manual instrumentation, it's going to go out and emit that data and the collector is going to pull it in. Then it's going to do some batch processing because there are processors that you can run inside of open telemetry. And definitely recommend you look at it. And then you have your exporter. Now, OTLP is an interesting thing. And this is where you really get into the whole vendor neutrality uh, conversation because a lot of people will, ex or a lot of vendors will accept OTLP formats at this point in time. But what happens is the databases that underlie those backend systems are those open source, are those open. If you, were, if you wanted to make the move, could you?